lack of spleen occasioned by the tiresome and enervating rigours of stagecoach travel through the Alps, his observations were no exaggeration, even if his diagnosis was wide of the mark. It's now known that this region suffered from an iodine deficiency in the diet, resulting in widespread goiter and lunacy. But the locals weren't the only ones to suffer from mental derangement. When the mission reached Turin, Hume fell ill. A fellow member of the mission recorded, He was affected by a most violent fever, attended with its natural symptoms, delirium and ravings. In the paroxysms of his disorder he often talked, with much seeming perturbation, of the devil, of hell, and of damnation, and one night, while his nurse-tender happened to be asleep, he rose from his bed and made towards a deep well which was in the courtyard, with a design, as was supposed, to drown himself, but, finding the back door locked, he rushed into a room where, upon a couch, the gentlemen of the family were, he well knew, used to deposit their swords, and here he was found by the servants who had been awakened by the noise he had made at the door in endeavouring to open it, and was by them forcibly brought back to his bed. Hume appears to have quickly recovered, and this whimsical adventure became a source of merriment amongst the company. Hume took a more sober view of it, remonstrating, Do you suppose philosophy to be proof against madness? The organisation of my brain was impaired, and I was as mad as any man in Bedlam. Hume appears to have been fully aware of, and feared, his largely latent mental disorder. And we can only speculate about its possible effect on his intellectual activities, though it's intriguing that such a thoroughgoing atheist should reveal manic fears of the devil, hell, and damnation. Likewise, one can only wonder how many other similar episodes occurred that were not recorded. Many important questions here will probably never be answered. General St. Clair and his secretary eventually brought their mission to a successful conclusion, having travelled all through Europe and achieved nothing. It's the achievements in this field that usually spell disaster. Hume then decided he'd had enough. Having educated a madman and served as secretary to a general, he now felt himself suitably qualified to re-enter the philosophic fray. He returned to Edinburgh, where he set about rewriting his great philosophic flop. The first part he turned into an inquiry concerning human understanding, the work that was to spread his ideas throughout Europe. The last part he turned into an inquiry concerning the principle of morals, which he always mistakenly believed to be his finest work. It may be difficult for some to see how a philosophical solipsist, who had exploded the notion of cause and effect, continuity, and even bodies, could embark upon a moral philosophy, but where ethics is concerned, Hume chooses to ignore the conclusions of his thoroughgoing empiricism in the inquiry. He does, however, attempt to relate his ethics to the structure of his empiricism. Thus passions observed in others are received as impressions. Compassion, on the other hand, begins as an idea, but if it is sufficiently strong and lively, can become an impression. As one would expect from Hume's temperament, his moral philosophy is essentially humane. Compassion, or sympathy, is seen as the basis of all moral qualities. This brings personal happiness as well as social benefit. Hume esteems moral qualities according to their usefulness or their agreeableness, with regard to the individual and the community. These ideas had developed from the democratic liberalism of Locke, which placed emphasis on a social contract guaranteeing citizens' natural rights under the law. Hume's ideas were to have a formative influence on the nineteenth-century utilitarians, such as Bentham and Mill, who developed them into the formula, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. But this laudable wish for social happiness had an inherent flaw. What of the scapegoat whose public hanging will give so much joy to the majority of the populace? Reducing public morality to a mathematical equation, with the majority carrying the day on all matters, leaves minorities vulnerable to discrimination. In 1752, Hume was made keeper of the Advocates Library in Edinburgh. This far from onerous employment gave him the opportunity to write more philosophical essays on a wide variety of subjects. The essay was all the rage at the time as the latest fashionable literary form. Although Hume was not as stylistically brilliant as Addison and Steele, his ideas were more profound. The topics of his essays ranged from disparate subjects such as politics and standards of public taste through analogous topics such as tragedy and marriage, to subjects as similar as polygamy and stoicism. 
His essays on economic topics included many formative ideas in this embryonic pseudoscience, and his essays on miracles, no such thing, and suicide, up to you, were to cause a sensation when they were finally published. As a result of his employment with General St. Clair, Hume had now seen firsthand what history was all about. Heartened by this insight, he decided to embark once more upon his history of England. This begins with the invasion of Julius Caesar in 55 BC and ends with the glorious revolution of 1688. Hume finally finished his history in 1762, having progressed at the rate of a century a year, at the same rate as Gibbon claimed while writing his Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which was published four years later. Hume's history was ranked as second only to Gibbon's masterpiece, but consistently outsold it and remained a bestseller for almost a century, until Macaulay's history became the standard work. Hume's History of England is highly readable, and was one of the first to broaden its scope by including the cultural and scientific interests of the period. Because it refused to subscribe to contemporary prejudices, it was immediately labelled as hopelessly biased. Hume's cultural comments strike me as being quite fair. He spoke of the poets of the previous century producing moments of genius perverted by indecency and bad taste, but none more than Dryden, both by reason of the greatness of his talents and the gross abuse he made of them. And his philosophical views often obtrude to fine effect. While Newton seemed to draw off the veil from some of the mysteries of nature, he showed at the same time the imperfections of the mechanized philosophy, and thereby restored her ultimate secrets to that obscurity in which they ever did and ever will remain. A year after Hume published his History of England, he was honoured by having all his works placed on the Roman Catholic Index of Banned Books. In the centuries before our era, this accolade was very similar to the Nobel Prize. It concentrated on genuine scientific, humanitarian, and literary achievements, but was occasionally extended to charlatans or harmless mediocrities for political reasons. In 1763, Hume was appointed secretary to the British ambassador in France. The war so successfully waged by the likes of General St. Clair and the commander of the garrison at Lorient had eventually been called to a halt by the forces of sanity. Hume's appointment in Paris was a huge success. He was now regarded as the British Voltaire and was lionized by fashionable society. The ambassador quickly realized that his secretary's presence on the salon circuit was worth far more to promote British interests than anything else the embassy could offer, and encouraged him to attend as many parties as possible. By now Hume was a repulsive figure. He was bloated and red in the face, ate too much, enjoyed his drink, and was generally rather clumsy, but he was also highly intelligent and had a fine droll wit. The French had never seen anything like this before. To them, elegance and wit were virtually synonymous. For one to appear without a semblance of the other was a truly British eccentricity. Owing to Hume's extreme ungainliness, he was even excused from bowing at court, and after one hilarious disaster was also no longer required to make his exit walking backward toward the door. Hume was presented to the king and all the members of his family, even his young grandchildren, who each had to memorize a little speech in honor of Monsieur Hume and how they were looking forward to reading his History of England. Despite Hume's appearance and enjoyment of social occasions, he was not exactly a happy man. Inwardly he kept a tight rein on his emotions. He enjoyed the company of women, but privately characterized himself as a gallant who gives no offense to husbands and lovers. Yet all this lionizing caused him momentarily to drop his guard, when he encountered a beautiful and intelligent woman who indicated that she was interested in him physically, he quickly fell for her. But this was France, where such things are never simple. The Comtesse de Boulefleur was the mistress of the Prince de Conti, one of the most powerful political figures in the land. She was thirty-eight. Hume was fifty-two. They quickly became friends, but were both wary of further involvement, they corresponded, using the elaborate manners of the period, as a subtle, devious, and often flimsy disguise for their true emotions. Hume told her, You have saved me from a total indifference towards everything in human life. But in the end, it seems they were both afraid of each other, and each became convinced of the futility of the situation. Nothing came of it, and when Hume returned to England in 1765, they never met again. Yet they did continue to correspond and the last letter we have in Hume's hand 
is addressed to his understanding countess. It was the Comtesse de Boufleur who was instrumental in Hume's meeting Rousseau, the great French political theorist and philosopher. Nowadays it's customary to characterize Rousseau as a madman and a bastard, in the pejorative sense, whose ideas lead directly to social evil of the worst kind. And there's no denying this case. Rousseau was mentally unstable. He personally delivered, one by one, all five of his 